<laughs> okay. My name is Lavona Spinagle. I w was Lavona Johnson. I was born in Cleburne on January 23rd, 1925. Very easy there. Take, uh, figure my age. Um, I went to school in Cleburne in the big stone schoolhouse and uh, my grandparents lived across the street from it and down to the south about, oh, about one house. And across the street, up on the hill, was people we called Papa and Mama Will's Dial. And uh, they were related to the Ron Dial that lives here in Blue Rapids. But um, I went to first and second grade in Blue Rap in Cleburne, and then went on out to Belgard. Uh, when I was about seven or eight years old, maybe nine, I came back up to Cleveland to spend uh, a week or two with my grandmother because they figured somebody should be there to be with her for a while. And that is when I got my first black eye. <laughs> I was a, went across the street to play with some kids at the school ground and Eddie Isaacson which happens to be a brother of Chester Isaacson, who lived here in town, he gave me a black eye. My first and only black eye. But uh, when I was in school in the first or second grade, we had lost our dog. And uh, of course, back then, dogs were very important because you didn't have TV, radio, and all that. But animals out in the in the uh, yard were very just wonderful. But we lost it through uh, dog fights. Some greyhounds came over into our yard and attacked our dog, and he died from the injuries. But my dad went across. He knew a, a couple, and he went over and he found a dog, which was a little. It's a mixture between a St. Bernard and a German Shepherd. And he brought it home and I came out and he picked us up from school and I went out to get in the car and I said, wait a minute, I want to go get me a library book. And my dad says, oh, I've got a library book here in the, in the car. So I jumped in the car figuring it was a library book. Instead of that, there was a little puppy in a box. And that proved to be a wonderful dog because I don't care what we did, the dog was there right beside us. And if we had ever screamed, the strange person that was with us would always uh, get the, his arm taken. I mean, the dog wouldn't bite him, but he would grab it and just hang on to it lightly so that the person couldn't go. Whether or not that person was in the right or wrong, it didn't make any difference. He, the dog always, grabbed a hold of the strange person. Uh, when I was in school, we lived north of town about two miles. And it was on a Fred Dial place. And across the fields to the north, about maybe a half a mile or maybe longer, lived a family by the name of Emil Riggles. That happens to be Kenny Riggles. Uh, grandparents and whenever it got too muddy they would hitch up their team of horses and buggy and we would be, all go to school ride to school in the team of horse within the buggy which was quite a treat to us so it, things like that stand out to us I told my mother one day after I grew up I says mom I remember in an old vehicle with snap curtains on it, the snow was coming in on me. And I says, we were moving, I remember that. But beyond that, I can't tell you anymore. She looked at me and she says, you was three years old that January, and we moved from one place to the other, and yes, it was snowing, and you was in the back seat. So I remember that just as plain as yesterday about snow coming in on my on me from the through the side curtains and that is something that 
a lot of people maybe don't remember. I may not remember things that happened two weeks ago, but that is something I remember. What were your folks' names? Your parents' My, names? my folks' name was Victor and Mary Johnson. And she was, what was her maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Novak. And my, my mother's uh, parents lived south of Irving about, oh, three, four miles. And, uh, of course, my uh, grandparents on my dad's side, of course, lived in Irving. I mean, in Cleveland. But uh, my grandparents, Grandpa and Grandma Novak, lived south of Irving on the old Calhoun place, which is another story. I'll get to that later on. Uh, but we used to go up and spend a week or two with each grandparents. Uh, I'd go to, we'd go to mom's grandparents and we would have coffee and cake, yellow cake with some kind of a hard frosting on it. And I don't mean like caramel, it was just like a glaze. And whenever we went to my grandparents on my dad's side, we had coffee with sugar cubes in it. But we always got to have one sugar cube that we could eat. But otherwise, I that's the reason I think I like coffee today, is because of the coffee from my grand, um, both my grandparents. And when we go up to uh, my folks, my grandparents on my mother's side, they live just across from the Vermilion River, or the mouth of the Vermilion River. And at the mouth of it, my uncle, who was way over six feet tall, he took one of these big bamboo poles and he went down, he could swim, but he went down into this hole and the bamboo uh, fishing pole went clear out of sight and he hadn't reached the bottom yet. But in that hole, there was a big fish that he tried to put his arms around and it wouldn't reach around it because it was, it was that big. But these places in the Blue River had big fish every now and then when they had these big holes that would uh, support them. So what I assume it was a yellow cat, and so did he. But that was the last we've ever even thought of it because he didn't go down there anymore. <laughs> but we used to go out on the uh, boat. It was no motor boat. It was a, they used the oars, and I enjoyed going out with my uncles out onto the river, up and down the river and back. But that was when I was little. And the uh, train from Manhattan to Marysville went right down below the hill of their house. And we used to go down and watch the trains go past and wave at the conductors or the engineers as they went past. They always tooted there for some reason. But uh, it was a lot of fun. And just south of that, south of their home, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile, was what they called Florina. And that was nothing but a whistle stop. It never was a town. It was always a place that I think they could either call in or something and they could always stop, the train could stop there and pick up something or unload it. Was and there the, a, a, a quarry there? There, uh, a, there was a, a rock quarry just to the, up close to the road uh, from that, but then there was a, strikers had a sand pit down there, across the track and down to the rip, to the river. There was a sand, uh, sand pit down there, and that was owned by strikers, and that was started there by strikers that I remember of. Was there a, a cemetery there too, like a Stoneman Cemetery or something like that? Does that ring a bell? I didn't know of any Stoneman, but when uh, we lived out east of town here, uh, I was calling Grandpa Layton, because that's what we called him, it was George Layton. He said that there were some people that were buried just south of uh, his home house, home uh, farm down there, which was the Calhoun place, and that was the, excuse me, that was the farm that my uh, grandparents owned. And so when they came around and was looking for uh, cemeteries, I told the people 
what Grandpa Layton had told me. Now, whether they ever checked it out or not, I don't know, or whether it never really existed, I don't know. But that's what he told. When we were, ma when we were married, now this is getting ahead of point, but when we were married and lived out here between uh, Blue Rabbits and Irving with Grandpa Layton, he'd sit there and tell a lot of stories to me, and that was one of them that he told. And he t also told about a man being scalded to death just south of Irving in an old, when an old steam uh, engine tipped over. And if I'm not mistaken, that man's name was a Tryon. But that's getting ahead of the story. Getting back to um, Cleveland, I'm holding a map. Of course, it doesn't have pictures, but I, I can I visualize all of Cleveland. I remember the Tabirons and the Musils and the Whites and all of them. They were all very vivid in my mind because I was interested in people, always have been, and I guess I always will be. Uh, Mrs. M.B. White was the mother of Oprah Rodarko, and she happens to be a mother of another girl, which I can't pull out her name. And uh, there was a Carlson. I think the other one married a Carlson, I believe. Anyway, when he was dating her and she was in high school, he would go down and uh, as he rounded the corner by the high school, he'd toot. And they were, and the girls would all flock to the window at the high school. Anyway, they tried to tell him, you can't do that. And at that time, it was permissible to honk at a corner. So they couldn't stop him. <laughs> and he, it was so many little t stories like that. Uh, Who were some of your teachers? Do you remember them? My first grade teacher was a Miss Marguerite Morris. I remember all of them. And the upstairs teacher was Emma Smith. And Emma Smith married a Clucky. And I got to visit with them after they were married. Well, after they'd been married for quite a long time. And I told Mr. Clucky, I says, you have her now, but I says, I remember her when she was upstairs and it would always be Miss Smith to me. And when I would, went to grade school in uh, Belgarden, my first teacher was a uh, Genevieve Modine, and she was great. And then this, uh, she married, and uh, I think she went overseas. I don't remember. But then it was Geneva Bergstein, and Geneva married a Johnson. Then when we went to uh, Randolph, my teacher was Bonus Kunze and I kept in contact with her because she graduated from Randolph, the same uh, school I did, so I got to uh, keep in contact with her. And then when she got married to uh, Walter Henry, then Vera Russell was my teacher. I didn't like her at all, because right at first, she came in at the middle, middle part of the term, and she gave us tests, so we went through what we had already did. And I thought, that's wasting our time. We already know that. <laughs> but she had to know exactly what we knew. But she turned out to be one of my best teachers and one of my favorite ones. And she was a daughter of Johnny Holmstrom. Uh, and so, now getting back to when I was in Cleveland, we moved from north of Cleveland out to uh, east and north of Cleveland on a farm. All the farmsteads are gone because of Tutter Creek. But I, will, we, uh, I had about two miles, a two and a tenth mile to go to Belgard School. And Belgard School was just uh, to the east of the old Mariah Doll uh, orphanage. orphanage. And the, the, we didn't get in contact with any of the people from there because they had their own school down there. And when our daughter, Judy, went to Bethany, one of the teachers down there, his parents was uh, one of the teachers or one of the caretakers down at Belgard or at this uh, orphan home. 
And so we got had quite a visit because he uh, about things around that area. So you never you, you always go places and you always uh, find somebody that has already been where you've been or you've uh, know people that they know. But then when we went to you didn't haven't run into other people from our idol orphanage. No, they stayed, they more or less uh -huh. kind of kept to themselves. There was enough children down there that they had their own, her own uh, teacher. And I don't even know who their teacher was. But, uh, but they had their own school and their own teacher. And it was built, the orphanage was built like two big stone houses put together. And uh, I can remember the roof being green. It was made out of stone, but the roof was green. And there was uh, windows up in the roof, just like it was clear, you know, like they had rooms up in the attic. That I can remember, but all that is gone. Do, but, you, do you remember some of the businesses downtown Cleburne? Oh yes, um, New Souls Cafe. My dad was a subcarrier from out of Cleburne, from before he got married until after he retired. And he sub-carried for Harry Seabrook. And Harry Seabrook lived on the east side of the river. Uh, Sini White had a little filling station on the east side of the river. And he lived over there, but yet his wife and two daughters lived on, up, uh, on the main street of town. It was always kind of funny. It was just a different thing. Um, to be honest, they had a lumber yard, I believe, and Samuelson's had a dry, dry goods store, and they lived upstairs, I believe. And that would have been uh, the parents of the Samuelson that owned the. Uh, Liquor, um, the uh, pool hall down here. And um, then there was always, I was trying to think who the name of the people was that owned the um, grocery store, and I can't pull it out. All I can remember was People's Grocery Store, but I can't remember exactly what, who, the, who it was. But uh, she highs, no, not she highs. Pogue, Pogue, uh, they, uh, Clint Pogue, run the, um, oh, just like produce, it was where you took your cream and your eggs and things. And that's where they, and they lived upstairs over the building. And that was where. Was that the one that moved to Blue Rapids? Yes, uh-huh, that okay, was, they so moved that's to Blue Rapids. Treva's dad. So that'd be Treva. There's some other kids. Okay, there was Alice and Duane. Dwayne was uh, had a something wrong with his mouth, it, hair lip. I think is what they call it then, and I think he had surgery and it took care of that. And Treva and Laura Bell and Nona, I believe, were the kids that I remember. Uh, the post office or uh, the buildings that are up on here on Main Street, um, behind uh, Mai's house, Elsa. Uh, you mean the buildings that be okay. buildings behind that? They could have been came from down there or someplace. I don't know. Oh, okay. But uh, the Methodist Church was down on the on the block to the west of Main Street, and the Lutheran Church was on the Main Street at the north side. Did those get moved somewhere that you're aware of? I don't think so. I not that I know of. Now the. Uh, Methodist Church, I think, was, it looked like it had stucco on it. It was, a, it was kind of a gold stucco. But the Lutheran Church was a wooden one. And I don't know, remember for sure where, where that would have gone. But uh, Isaacson's lived up just above to the west of the Lutheran Church. There was two sets of Isaacson's down there. 
So, Bonard Isaacson was the one that lived north of my grandparents, and Waldemar Isaacson was the one that lived to the west of the Lutheran Church. So. And you moved out to the Fred Dial place we, at one time? We lived on Fred Dial's place twice. We lived out there first, then they moved off, and then they moved back. And were that, was that house still standing into the, before the dam? That house was standing until the dam took it down. Uh, Sutherland's lived in that for a while. Uh, I can't tell you the Paul. name. Paul. Paul and Beth lived out okay. there. Okay, okay, that's what That would have been her folks' that would, place. That's Elizabeth. Uh-huh. To me, it was... Uh, Elizabeth? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, uh, Elizabeth was her mother's, no, Kate was her mother's name. Kate was Fred Dial's wife's name. Elizabeth we knew as Alan. <laughs> Alan Dial. Uh -huh. And I don't know why. Uh -huh. Bob was her brother. Uh -huh. And he married uh, Martinson. Weren't there two houses out there, though? There was the house that big house that we lived in, which was Fred Dial's, and then uh, just to the uh, south of them was a big stone house, which was Jim, which was George Dial's house. George and Jim lived there with George's two kids, Laura Bell and Kent Clarence. And, and those were like brothers to Fred? They were brothers of Fred, yeah. George Jim was. and George were brothers of Fred. And, um, then I think they built a little home, a little house, down there, halfway in between. Uh, and I, kind of like a, a, down in a little ravine down there. I think there was a little house built. But uh, uh, from the road up in the hillside was a stone cave. And of course, we never went up into it because I was scared of cows and there was always cows up in the pasture. But yeah, there was a stone uh, cave up in there. That's the only thing that remains that you can actually find the farmstead. You can, fi you can the find cave that is still cave there. And you can find that stone house at uh, George and Jim. That's the one that uh, Horolix. Oh, it is. Shorty Horolix. And if I'm not mistaken, they had a, a closet that opened and they could pull a bed down out of the closet. Now whether it was still there or they did away with it, I don't know. But I remember that. I think that's where Carolyn still lives, isn't it? Carolyn Heralic, their daughter. I don't know who, oh, if anybody did. lives there or not. Uh -huh. Last report I knew it was empty, but I don't know. But that's an old, old home. So, and that across the creek and over across was where um, Ellsworth Limburgs lived. Well, it would be uh, Fritz Limbo would be his dad, and uh, it'd be the, a whole bunch of boys and one girl. They only had one sister, and that is well before my dad ever went to. Well, probably right after he came home from service, he bought a new Model T, and he drove it into the barn. Of course, he was working for Fritz. He drove it into the barn that night. I don't know what happened, but lightning struck or what? But barn and vehicle all oh. burned. Oh. And in the telegraph paper, oh, within the last maybe 10, 15 years or so, they someone told, I think it was um, Mrs. Lindblom from uh, Waterville, she told about um, Fritz's barn, you know, brand barn, brand new barn being burnt. And uh, so I wrote up and I said, and the rest of the story is that it was my dad's vehicle that was burned in the, in the barn. So was that World War I? Or yes, did my, your dad fight or was my he? My dad, uh, <laughs> when he was a, a boy, he was playing him and his brother, and he, he an arrow hit him in the eye, and all he could see from there on was just daylight. He could see light, and that was it. 
And when uh, World War One came, uh, he his name came up, and of course, Fritz said, "I can get you out because you can uh, would uh, be a good helper for me." And Dad said, "No," he said, "My name is called. I go." So he went down. He took the physical, even with that one eye just being able to see light out of it. They took him in. He ha he's right-handed. He had to learn to shoot left-handed, and he went across. Had what three months training, and then went across. He or had training down at Camp Thompson, and then he went across, and he was over across one year, and his helmet that his kids used to play with had a big dent in it. Well, uh, a shrapnel or something that hit it.